What's up guys, JC here. Now before we even begin this video, I gotta say that I, I made this video on my old channel and I received a lot of hate. In, in fact, some of it was damn near death threats. Some people were saying that I sound cocky. Some people were saying all kinds of stuff. Just real quick, I'm editing this video and I wanted to add that if you are a veteran flyer and you know the full potential and the limits of the Na32 Rep6 and you are perfectly fine with that, then by all means keep using it. I am not telling you to throw it away and buy something else, use whatever you want to. I am only here to inform. I also want to say that I do respect the Nace 32 because it was one of the first, it got us to where we are today, but much like the Ford Model T, I do respect it for being the beginning of the modern automotive era, but in 2017, would I actually drive a Ford Model T? No, no I wouldn't, but I do respect it. But the point of this video is for me just to inform, that is it. And I really hope there are a lot of new guys watching this video because this video is really for you. I understand when you first jump into this hobby, you don't know the difference between the flight controllers, uh, the capabilities of them, the different features some have to offer. And with so much content on the internet of the NACE32, it, it's really easy to think that it's the best flight controller out there because so many people use it. And by far, it is the most common flight controller. So the way this video is going to work is I'm going to give you a visual demonstration in beta flight of the CPU load between the NA32, a F3 processor flight controller, and then a F4 processor flight controller. Then I will show you the differences on paper and explain, I will go further into detail and explain why you probably don't want one. And then I will cover a few other things after that. So first, let's go into beta flight and this is probably going to be the most uh, entertaining part of the video. Right now I'm plugging in a NA32 Rep6 and if we connect, what we want to keep an eye on in this test is the CPU load. Uh, a good CPU load is going to be I would say 35% or below. And I've set up these flight controllers to how I would actually fly them. I, it's not like I'm just plugging them in with fresh firmware or anything like that. So if we go to ports, I've got uh, my S bus receiver and telemetry on the soft serial. Then if we go, let's just go to modes. The only switch I have is ARM. I really don't have that much going on right now. One shot, 125 ESCs, uh, my S bus receiver, VBAT so I can see my battery voltage, and really not that much. Once again, soft serial and telemetry. So the CPU load looks pretty good right now, but if you bring the gyro update frequency up, and if you don't already know, basically the higher the number, the better, the faster things are going to run. So let's bring it up to a 2 kilohertz, and we'll set the PID loop frequency to 1 kilohertz, and save. Okay, it's already jumped up to, looks like 20%. Now the thing is, one shot 125 ESCs are now technically outdated. I, th I mean, I'm not saying they're bad. I still use them on half of my builds, but point is, one shot 125 ESCs can run a 2 kilohertz PID loop frequency. And even since then, I mean, one shot 125 is only a year old. They came out a year ago. And since then, we have upgraded from that to one shot 42, and then right after that was multi shot, and now we have D shot. So one shot 125 is technically outdated, but like I said, it can run a 2 kilohertz PID loop frequency. And now we are at 100% CPU load. Like it's having a tough time rebooting right now. Your multi rotor at this point would not even arm. It, it won't even function because the processor is it's doing way too much right now. It, it can't handle this. So let's bring this back down to 1 kilohertz. Now a lot of guys buying the NACE32 are new guys and new guys usually don't start off on acro flight mode because that's the hardest one. You normally want to start off on angle or horizon. Well, for angle and horizon you need the accelerometer to have those flight modes. So let's just turn on the accelerometer. And we're back up to 100%. It won't even function. Now let's disconnect and plug in a F3 processor flight controller. Right now I'm going to use the SP Racing EVO. So once again, I've got it set up with my uh, SBUS receiver, smart port, got the onboard uh, SD card going at 100%, got the black box and arm turned on, 
multi-shot ESCs. Once again, S-Bus, S -bus receiver, V-Bat, and telemetry, black box, and air mode this time. So we've added a little bit more to it. And we're sitting at 3% at 2 kilohertz and 1 kilohertz. Now, all F3 processor flight controllers can handle a 4 kilohertz gyro update frequency. And 2 kilohertz is, that would be if you were using uh, one shot 125 ESCs. So this is how I would actually fly it, the way it's set right now. And we are sitting at 6%. What if I turn on the accelerometer, barometer, and magnetometer? All right, we're at 12%. What if I max it out at eight kilohertz? We've got eight kilohertz on the gyro update frequency and four kilohertz on the pid loop frequency. And now we're sitting at that 35% that I was saying is good. Not only do we have this maxed out at eight kilohertz and sitting at 35%, but I've also got the magnetometer and barometer going at the same time. Just out of curiosity, what if we do this? Well, it looks like it can't handle that. That's why I run at a four kilohertz pid loop frequency. And now we're back down to 20% with the accelerometer, magnetometer, and barometer turned off, which is how I actually fly. Now let's check out a F4 processor. And this one I have not set up to how I would actually fly it. In fact, I turned on as much crap as I possibly could. So now we've got the S-Bus receiver, smart port, and GPS. On the black box, I got it logging at the eight kilohertz uh, log rate. I've got, this flight controller actually has a built-in on-screen display, so I've got an on-screen display going. Bunch of different switches for my flight modes and everything else. Multi-shot ESCs. S bus receiver, VBAT, and current, GPS, 8 kilohertz on both the gyro update frequency and pit loop frequency with the accelerometer, magnetometer, and barometer turned on. Now it doesn't actually have a magnetometer, so it's not going to raise the CPU load for that one, but both of these are. And then telemetry, LED strip, black box, air mode, and on screen display. And we are sitting at 7 or to 8%. Now let's do a comparison on paper, and let me explain to you why uh, the NACE32 can't keep up. So I will compare it to my personal favorite, the Omnibus F3. Uh, now that F4 processor board I just showed you in that test was the Omnibus F4, but I'm not even going to use it for this comparison because it's not even going to be fair. So the NACE32 has a F1 processor, the Omnibus has a F3 processor. The NA32 uses the CP2102 driver, where most flight controllers nowadays are switching to a virtual COM port. The difference is, with the CP2102 driver flight controllers, uh, they require a UART that is tied into the USB. So technically, your USB is a UART. The problem with this is, whenever you have a device connected to a UART, by the way, a UART is just pins or something that you can add devices into your flight controller through. So uh, like your receiver, telemetry, on-screen display, GPS, so on, so on. But one of these UARTs, which is UART number one, is tied into the USB because of the CP2102 driver. This means that if you try to plug in your USB and you have a device connected to UART number one, then whenever you go to beta flight and clean flight, that device is going to be talking to the NA32 and your computer is talking to the NACE32 both at the same time and then everything gets confused, it doesn't know what to do, beta flight or clean flight starts locking up, uh, sometimes your settings won't save, a bunch of crazy stuff starts happening. So that's why you have to disconnect the device from UART1 before you go into beta flight or clean flight. So it doesn't sound like that big of a deal but it, it is pretty annoying. Where the virtual COM port flight controllers, uh, well first with the F3 processor you get three UARTs instead of two but none of the, those UARTs are tied into the USB. The USB, it's, it's on its own, doing its own deal. So you don't have to ever disconnect any devices or worry about anything. So VCP is better. The NA32 uses the I2C form of communication where most flight controllers nowadays are switching to SPI. SPI is much faster. If you saw the CPU load, 
the reason the Nay32 can't handle as much is because of I squared C. SPI is much faster. So if you do plan on using even one shot 125, like I said, those are outdated ESCs. Technically, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying they're bad, but they are outdated. Outdated by one shot 42, multi shot, and now D shot. But the Nasser 2 can't even use the full potential of an outdated ESC. So SPI is better. Now, there are F3 flight controllers still use an I squared C, but because of the F3 processor, they can handle things much better. Moving on, like I said, the Nasser 3 2 only has two UARTs because of the F1 processor, where all the F3 processor boards have three UARTs. Now, the Omnibus is special because it has a built in on screen display, and this doesn't require one of the three UARTs. So, technically, you can have four devices connected. So, that's better. Now the Nasser 2 does have two soft serials where the Omnibus has no soft serials, but, well first let me explain, a soft serial is basically, you can make that, in easy terms, it's a slow UART, a really slow UART. So really the Nasser 2 theoretically can have four devices connected to it. Uh, but is this better because it has that? No, because the Omnibus still has a total of four devices you can connect. So four fast devices versus two fast and two slow. So that's better. The LEDs on the Nasser 2 are shared with the soft serials. So if you want to use LEDs, you will have to place that on the soft serial. But chances are, because you don't have that many devices you can connect to this, you already have a device on that soft serial. So then you have to pick and choose. Say you have your telemetry on the soft serial. Well, if you have that on the soft serial, you can't use LEDs. So then you have to pick and choose. Well, do I want LEDs or do I want my telemetry? Or do I want my on-screen display? Or do I want GPS? With F3 and F4 boards, uh, they have dedicated LED pins. In fact, everything is dedicated. Uh, in fact, you can use anything you want. You can have your SBUS receiver, telemetry, on-screen display, and GPS all running at the same time. You don't have to pick and choose whatever you, you know, you get everything. You can have your cake and eat it too. The Nasser 2 has, depending on the model, 2 to 16 megabytes of internal uh, flash storage for uh, recording like black box logs once you get into tuning your PIDs, things like that. A lot of these flight controllers are now putting on the SD card readers and you can place up to a 32 gigabyte memory card into your flight controller. And this is going to be like the SP Racing Evo, the SP Racing Mini and a few others. So that's better. This really isn't that big of a deal, but the Nasser 2 does not have a built-in voltage regulator, meaning you will have to use an external 5 volt power source, either linear ESCs or a more advanced and more expensive PDB like this that has a 5 volt regulator built in. The Omnibus has it built in. This allows you to use a super simple and super cheap PDB. So that's better. Uh, because this does not have the built-in voltage regulator, it has VBAT pins, you have to do extra wiring and things like that to get voltage in beta flight, clean flight, on-screen displays, and telemetry, where it's automatically placed into not just this flight controller, but any flight controller that has the built-in voltage regulator, which is going to be the SP Racing Mini, uh, the Omnibus F4, then you got the Dodo, and a few others. Now I could keep going on and on and on. I could fill this page up of why every other flight controller is better than the Nay32, but I'm not. Now the other reason why so many people say they like the Nay32 is because of the price point, because it's so cheap. So let's look at some average prices. If you go to any reputable website and get an, an authentic Nay32, then you're looking at $25, $24, $25, $30, you get the idea. So about $24. Now what a lot of people do is go to Amazon or eBay and get them cheaper. Now these aren't authentic, they are clones. I'm not telling you not to buy a clone, I'm just saying be careful because there are some knockoffs that just don't work. So that's a risk you have to take. Uh, but $21, $35, $24, $30, $36, $26, $26, $27, $28, $29, $30, $31, $32, $33, $34, $35, $36, $37, $38, $39, $40, $41, $42, $43, $44, $45, $46, $47, $48, $49, $50, $51, $52, $
Uh, anyway, let's just say you get one for $13, where the Omnibus F3 is selling for $23. Well, you're going to want to add in an on-screen display. Almost everybody uses on-screen displays. Not only is it great for being able to see your battery voltage, current, altitude, throttle position, flight modes, and much more, uh, you can also tune your PIDs or change your PIDs through the TX menu, uh, which eliminates the need of bringing a laptop with you into the field. You can just change your PIDs, rates, everything from your on-screen display. Now the cheapest one I can find, and it's actually one that I do use, is going to be the Minim OSD Micro. I get them off of Amazon for 11 bucks, so let's just say 11 bucks. Uh, and like I said, that's one of the cheapest ones you're going to find, and that's going to bring us to a total of 24 dollars. Now, say you you actually spend about 20 dollars for an A32, then you're up to 31 dollars. But we're not even going to let's not even talk about that. We won't even bring that up. Now the Omnibus, like I said, is $23 and the on-screen display is built in. Not only is it built in, but it's already wired for you, it's set up for you, there is no flashing firmware, there's no configuration. You just plug this into Betaflight and the new Betaflight OSD feature handles everything for you, where this is usually a headache. So now we're at a total of $24 versus $23. We're already a dollar cheaper and everything, the OSD is set up for you, the voltage is set up for you. The you can use a simple PDB, everything's faster. So my question is, yes, people are correct. Uh, they like the NAS32 because it's so cheap. But is it? Is it really the cheap? Do you wanna spend, let's just say this is, we'll just say this is $23. So they, you're gonna spend the same amount of money either way. Do you wanna spend $23 for this? Or do you want to spend $23 for this. And if I don't recommend the NACE32, what do I recommend? Anything. Anything is better than the NACE32. Like I, like I said, I, I'm not trying to sound cocky. I'm not trying to sound like a dick. I'm just here to help you guys because I sometimes I don't understand the logic. But I mean, I mean, you got the SP Racing Evo, the Dodo, SP Racing Mini, X Racer F303 version 3.1, X Racer 2.1. Uh, you know, the Omnibus, Omnibus F4, uh, the CC3D Revo, pretty much anything is going to be better. But that's going to do it for this video, guys. So I hope I cleared this up for you. I hope I helped you out. Maybe you'll, you'll leave with something that you didn't come in with. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.